I'll tell you what, Leah, nobody likes a math teacher that isn't on time. So what do you say we rock and roll here? Welcome, everybody. So glad you're here. Sounds great, Alex. Well, I want to welcome and thank everyone for joining us on our um, Discover Math Together virtual class again today. Um, my name is Leah Dara. I'm the Vice President for Education for California State PTA. And joining me behind the scenes to monitor our chat are Rochelle Pierce, our District President from 21st District and a member of the Education Commission, as well as Ellen Torres, a member of the Convention Commission. So thank you to both of those um, brave volunteers for um, doing the behind the scenes work. I wanna go over a few uh, housekeeping uh, items before we start. For this call, all attendees will be muted. So please type your questions into the chat box. Chat monitors will be following along during Alex's talk and we will uh, give your questions to Alex during the question and answer breaks. And for those of you who are wondering, this class will be recorded and available in our new resource library on the California State PTA website. This is the last of a three-part series helping to launch California PTA's Discover Together campaign. So I'm super excited to introduce to you Alex Kajitani, the 2009 Teacher of the Year and a top four finalist for National Teacher of the Year. He's known around the world as the Rapid Mathematician. During the COVID-19 shutdown, Alex created Wacky Math Hour, a free online weekly class to help kids learn, keep kids learning and excited about math. Alex is also on a mission to get every kid in America to learn their times tables. And to make this happen, he created a wildly popular online program, multiplicationnation.com. Alex is a highly sought after author and keynote speaker who supports and motivates teachers, parents, and students nationwide. He has a popular TED Talk and has been honored at the White House and was featured on the CBS Evening News. I'm excited to see what Alex has in store for us today. So please join me in welcoming Alex Kajitani. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us. I see some familiar faces out there. I see some new faces and am absolutely honored. As always, I have one goal, and that is for you to finish our time together and think to yourself, wow, that was totally, totally worth it. So I'm so excited to come back. I'm, uh, of course, I'm as excited as I am sad that this is our last time together, uh, but uh, Hopefully, like I said, you found it worthy. You keep coming back, so hopefully that means you do. And tonight will be no exception. So I'm excited to talk about some ways, 10 ways specifically, that parents can help their kids succeed in math, even if you don't generally consider yourself a math person. And so just a quick review, as every good teacher should do, right? Two weeks ago, we really talked and looked at five things that you can do to help your math resistant kid, right? If you have a kid who is really resisting math, who doesn't like math, we talked about some things. First, we talked about not saying that you are or were bad at math, right? And just not ever putting that in your own child's head that you're not good at math. You may not feel you're good at math, but giving them a chance to figure that out for themselves and to not think that you know, their fate is predetermined because they have a parent who wasn't so good at math. Try to re trying to reframe that for you as thinking about it. Hey, if you know how to count, add and subtract, then you know enough math to help your child build a solid foundation when they are, were young or when they are young. If you can count, if you can add, if you can subtract, you can show your child that you actually are really good at math at the critical age when they're forming their attitude about math. We looked at uh, media images of mathematicians as nerdy and boring and how we can undo that. And we also talked about the link between reading and math and how so many kids, especially girls who are really good at reading and are actually pretty good at math, but when they compare the two test scores, they see that they're good at reading and they automatically think that they're not good at math because the scores don't match up when really they just started reading when they were two, but didn't start formally studying math until they were four or five. 
Second thing we talked about is focusing on math being fun instead of a problem to be solved. The math magician was here to daze and astound us with his math magical powers. And don't worry, he will be back at the end of tonight to close us out with a few magic tricks that will make you say, wow. Uh, third, very important to remember that sometimes competence has to come before confidence, right? Sometimes students who are not confident in math, it's just that they lack some of the competent skills. Of course, as you heard Leah say, I'm on a mission to help every kid master their times tables. And so many of you have signed up for the free trial of Multiplication Nation. Thank you so much for that. I've gotten some great feedback and been in dialogue with a lot of you. We can avoid kids getting frustrated in math when we help them master their times tables and get the competence. I talked about my own daughter and the, the trouble that I was having teaching her. So if you're at home during, dur if you were at home during the COVID shutdown struggling to teach your own kids, you are not alone. And we also talked about what happens when kids take, can, can take the, their, the initiative to help themselves learn some math. Fourth, we talked about connecting math to their world and being curious. Hey, when you're playing those video games, how, what are some ways that you use math? When you're doing that art, how are you using angles? And when we're cooking together, what are some ways that we can use math? And fifth, we talked about letting them see you use math and ask their opinion. No longer should a kid ever ask you, mom, dad, or whoever, how long till we get there? Next time someone asks how long till we get there, you turn to them and say, well, it's 30 miles away. We're leaving at 435. What time do you think we'll get there? Let's build their number sense through all of the little and fun things and ways that we can in math. Then last week, we gathered to check out some engaging and amazing resources for learning math online. We had a good time checking out some different websites, virtual manipulatives, things like that. I know that Cole emailed uh, the list out uh, the, uh, and the link the very next day. So hopefully you got that and you can use them in helping your own child. We've truly spent some time discovering together. And tonight, we're gonna to look at 10 ways that you can help your kid or kids succeed in math. Again, even if you don't specifically consider yourself a math person, or as we like to say, you don't consider yourself a math person yet. And so the first tip, the first way is to remember the printing press, right? The printing press was invented in the mid 1400s and you know, before the printing press was invented, there were still books, but if you wanted to duplicate a book, you had to hire a, you know, writers would, or scribes would copy the book down, artists would have to redraw the picture, and it, looked, it took a lot of time to make a copy of a book, right? As a result, very few people knew how to read, but there was this whole industry around the printing press. Then the printing press got invented and everything changed, right? Suddenly, artists and scribes were out of work, but an entire new industry was built up around the printing press. Many, many, many more people learned to read, and I would actually also argue that that much, that the flow of information exploded in a way that wasn't seen again until the internet came to be. But here we are again, in this crazy year where everything is changing, everything is shifting, online programs are blossoming, you know, online learning is this big new sort of printing press of a thing, and we've got to be able to go with the flow. We've got to be able to adjust because as we can see, an entire new industry, a new way of thinking, new flow and access to information is opening it up, especially as schools are starting to announce or have been announcing that we're going to online learning for the beginning of the year. Number two, I want to make this very clear. There is going to be a lot of talk, if you haven't already, on what we call learning loss, right? You may have heard of the summer slide. Research has shown that on average, a student loses about 20% or about a month of what they learn in school just on a, during a normal summer. Of course, this summer is a summer like no other. So instead of focusing on learning loss, however, because there's going to be a lot of it, and it's very important, but instead of focusing on learning loss, a way that you can help your child succeed is just focus on where they are. Look, 
if your kid doesn't remember something that you taught them, that's where they are. If they got an A on their math in math last year and suddenly it seems like they can't do it anymore, that's where they are. Don't worry about it. Just focus on where they are and then let's get them to where they can be and maybe push them a little bit further. I have to tell you this quick story. A few years ago, I had uh, a student named Eduardo and Eduardo really struggled in school. He was uh, one of my students. And one day I heard a student say to Eduardo, well, come on, Eduardo, you don't even know how to tell time. And so as a teacher, like it's decision time, right? How do I handle this situation? So I went over to him and I said, is that true that, that you don't know how to tell time? He said, yeah. I said, how come? He said, I don't know. I said, no, really, how come? How come you, don't, you haven't learned how to tell time? And he looked at me and he said, nobody ever taught me. Now, maybe somebody taught him, maybe they didn't, maybe he was absent on the day it was covered, right, in school or something. But here I was with a student in front of me who did not know how to tell time. I could have blamed the parents. I could have blamed Eduardo himself. I could have blamed the teachers who came before him, but none of those would have solved Eduardo's problem. So I got the class started on an activity. I sat down with him. I took the clock off the wall. I said, do you know your, I said, do you know your multiples of five, five, 10, 15, 20? Yeah, okay, then you know enough to tell time. Within 20 minutes, he knew how to tell time. He even went on. Now, after that, his confidence really started to increase. And he even went on to, to help produce the next rap and mathematician video. If you haven't guessed by now, that's Eduardo right there on the screen. And the rap and mathematician video that he helped produce, so many lines, actually won the Ivy or Innovative Video and Education Award for best student film for middle school that year. So just for fun, because that's what we're doing, we're discovering together, I wanted to show you this video. Hard to believe this video has received hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube and is being used in homes and classrooms all over the world to make math cool. So this one's for you, Eduardo, a short clip from so many lines. <laughs> So many lines, so many lines, so many lines in the world today. So many lines, so many lines, going every direction and every way. So many lines, hard to tell them apart. Where do they end? Where do they start? There's lines on your hands and lines on your feet. There's lines on the sidewalk and in the street. There's lines on the buildings and on the wall. There's even some lines on a basketball. And not every line happens to be straight like the line of potatoes on my dinner plate and what about the lines like the railroad track you mean parallel lines yeah you got my back well parallel lines are ones that never touch they never intersect and that's why they are so yeah parallel lines are two lines that never touch they never intersect and that's why they are so oh parallel lines like the sides of a ladder yeah parallel lines you pick the subject matter so many lines so many lines so well, that's for you, Eduardo, right? But one of the things that we can also do to help our students in, in math, right, is anytime we know about any sort of math concept, parallel lines, right? Looking out the window and pointing out all of the places that we see parallel lines, or if we're studying triangles, all the places that we can see triangles in the world. Just focus on where your child is, not so much on learning loss. The third tip that I have for you that you can help that will help your kid or kids succeed in math is that it's okay to struggle at least a little bit. Look, I know we've all met so many of us have seen our kids with a little bit of tears in their eyes or, you know, really struggling with math, but it is okay for them to struggle. As teachers, sometimes we spend, or as parents, we're worried, right? We're worried that our kid's gonna, you know, get really frustrated and think that they hate math, but it's okay to step back just a little bit. I have to tell you, I was listening to a science podcast and I heard this story that was that made such an impression on me. This guy was uh, growing milkweed in his yard and butterflies were eating the milkweed and caterpillars were growing and things like that. So one morning, 
He gets his coffee. He goes, he sits on the patio. He's sitting there and he sees like a, a cocoon or a chrysalis, whatever you call it. You know, it's, it's shaking. And all of a sudden it opens up a little bit and this wing of a butterfly starts to emerge. And he thinks, oh my gosh, I've never seen this before. This is amazing. This is a miracle. I, I've, never, I've never seen this in real life. I can't wait. And butterfly gets about half its wings out and then it stops and it sits there and it sits there. And for like 20 minutes, it doesn't move. And he thinks, oh no, this butterfly is not going to make it. I better help it, right? So he goes inside. He has these tiny little medical scissors. He brings them outside. He makes a tiny little cut in the cocoon and this stunningly beautiful butterfly emerges. And he thinks, I did it. Like I saved the butterfly, I, I helped it. I cannot wait to watch it, you know, fly away. And the butterfly sits there and it sits there and it sits there and it never flies. And then this hawk, no, just kidding about the hawk. I'm joking, I'm joking about the hawk. But what he later learns is, what was happening inside that cocoon when the butterfly was still, it was bashing its wings in order to get out. And by bashing its wings, it was building up the wing strength in order to fly. By cutting it open, he had robbed the butterfly of that opportunity to build up that wing strength. I'm not saying don't help your kids at all. I'm saying it's okay to sit beside them and say, let's figure this out together. It's okay when you see your kids struggling to use an old teacher strategy that we use, which is bite your tongue and slowly count to 10. You will be surprised at how kids can figure something out if given 10 to 15 seconds. But 10 to 15 seconds feels like a really long time for us as parents. And so sometimes we've just got to step back and it's, remember, it's okay to struggle at least a little bit. Number four, really critical, is that consistency is key, right? You can really help your child succeed in math by providing them with as consistent as possible a schedule, a place where they can do their math, and you know any sort of expectations that you have. So, you know, I don't know what your school is going to look like or what your child's school is going to look like, but you know, obviously a lot of us are a lot of our students are going to be on full-time distance learning. So they're going to have some homework to do. They're going to have some math to do. They're going to have to spend some time. So being able to say, okay, you know, you can use, you know, in 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 your room or if you're going to be at the kitchen table or wherever you are, but trying to block off a consistent time, right? Now here's Here's the nice thing about distance learning. It has some advantages. If your child, especially if you've got like a middle schooler or an early high school, high schooler, research shows they don't really get up and get going till about 10 or 1030. So instead of having them wake up and, you know, immediately do their math, maybe their brain doesn't really kick into gear until after lunch. Find what time your child or children are at their brain best. And you may have two different children at totally different brain best times. You're just gonna have to do the best you can, right? But figure out what time is best, but then whenever possible, stick to that consistent schedule. I've always believed that it's better to do 10 minutes of math for five days in a row than 50 minutes in one day, right? Just little bits of consistency. Now you may have a child who really wants to get all of it done all in that first hour or get all their assignments done and get it over with. As long as it's not detracting from the quality of their learning, that's fine. But I've always believed and found consistency just a little bit every day with math, a lot better, a lot more effective, I should say, than a lot in one day. Consistency is key. The other nice thing about consistency, right? Maybe you've got a dog who barks a lot and is distracting for your child. You could take the dog for a walk at the exact time when they can get a quiet house in order to do some math. So whatever your schedule looks like, whatever the rhythms of your house look like this year, remember that consistency <clears throat> is key. Number six might be kind of an obvious one. Did I just skip from four to six? Wait a minute. I did. <laughs> Leave it to a math teacher, right? I've discovered my mistake, but not to worry. Headphones are very helpful, right? Look, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of distractions happening in the typical household, right? There are phones that are ringing. There are phones that are dinging. There are text messages coming in. There are neighbors. There are 
you know, doorbells ringing with Amazon delivery people, right? If you can have your student put the headphone on, whether, you know, in, whether they're watching, if they're, you know, watching interactive videos with the math or even just noise canceling headphones or whatever, when we can get rid of distractions, it allows our brain to just focus on the math. Look, our kids have become phenomenal multitaskers. And as a result, they think oftentimes that they're at their best when they're being, you know, when they've got a whole bunch of things going on. When it comes to math though, really seeing if we can make that effort to get them to focus deeply on the math and cutting out as many distractions as we possibly can. I did skip six, weird, or five, but not to worry, I'll make it up in the end. I'm like the airlines, I'll make up the uh, information in flight. Okay, this one is really, really critical, right? It's important to remember that seeing and hearing are different, right? When kids see numbers, it basically, not to oversimplify it, but it goes into their eye and then into their brain for processing. When kids hear numbers, it goes through into their ear and follows a different path to get to their brain. So let's say we're working on our times tables with one of our kids, right? We're working on our times tables and we're working on eight times seven. Little tidbit of information here. I call eight times seven the number one most missed math fact of all time. I can honestly say I have graded by hand thousands of times tables tests. Eight times seven is the number one most this math fact of all time. So if you're wondering how proficient your own child is with the times tables, just ask them, hey, what's eight times seven? And see if they can produce 56. Uh, so anyway, that being said, so we're working on our times tables. Let's say we're working on flashcards, right? So we're holding them up and we're working on it and they're looking and they're seeing the numbers, right? They're seeing the numbers, they're processing the numbers through their eyes, visually. And then an hour later, they walk into the room. After we're done, they're doing something else. They walk into the room and we go, hey, what's eight times seven? And they go, uh, and they cannot produce an answer. When just an hour earlier, they were totally rocking it. It does not mean that they don't know what eight times seven in is. It means that they're used to seeing it with their eye and suddenly they're being asked to say it in a completely, they're asked to process it in a completely different way. For a visual learner who's used to seeing the numbers and who thrives on seeing the numbers, suddenly hearing it, it, it sort of mis it misfires and trips them up. Likewise, if you have a student who's really good at, you know, listening to songs and then they can repeat all the lyrics and they, they can hear things, right, really well, and then all of a sudden we put a math test in front of them and they see eight times seven and they have a hard time coming up with the answer. So here's what, for example, I taught one of my daughters to do. She's very visual, right? So I taught her just, just Okay, anytime anybody asks you a math question, right, what you do is you picture a blank whiteboard in front of your face. And then if I say, what's eight times seven, you picture on there eight times seven, and you see eight times seven, and then you can figure out what the answer is. So now when I walk up to her and I ask her, hey, what's seven times six, you'll see her go 42, right? Sometimes somebody will ask her a question and she'll say, you know what, I, I really need to learn math visually. Let me grab a paper and a pencil and write it down and then she can get it. Sometimes you, a, an auditory learner needs to see something and then they'll say out loud, if they see six plus six, teach them to say six plus six is, and when they hear it, then they can produce an answer. Again, seeing and hearing are different and being cognizant of that is really, really helpful. One of the things that I have noticed throughout our sessions together is that many of you have lots and lots of questions. I love answering questions and I've heard from many of you that you've gotten a lot out of, you know, answering the questions. And so, oh, before I go to that, don't forget kinesthetic activities as well, right? If you have an active kid, you know, maybe while they're jumping rope, they could be skip counting their sixes. Maybe sometimes talking about math and things like that, they just need to get up and be moving around. Not every kid needs to be sitting at a desk doing math. Some kids could be walking around. Some kids might find it outside along, as long as there's you know, no distractions. But incorporating some kinesthetic activities into learning math 
can be really valuable as well. So that being said, I noticed that people have a lot of questions. The last few times uh, I haven't left, I think quite enough time for questions. So I wanna make sure, make sure, make sure that I do that now. So that being said, it's time for our mid-session questions, comments, thoughts. I'm gonna take my screen off of uh, share and I'm gonna let Leah take a look at the comments sections. And I, any question goes, whatever's on your mind, whatever you're thinking about, happy to answer it before we get to the next, the next series of tips. Leah, what's the, yeah, what's Alex, on your mind? So we've got uh, one, just want to let you know, we've got one student who dropped what, he, what they were doing, some kids, because they heard your rap. So you're, you're sucking in the students, even as you're, as you're going to, <laughs> um, so someone here asked if they, how to determine if your child is a visual or auditory learner. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's a really good, um, that's a really good one. So I, um, so first you could kind of look at, um, you know, does your child prefer to read? Like if, like, did, is your child, does your child prefer to read or do they prefer to like listen to audio books, right? It's the same information that's getting into their brain, but some kids will have a strong preference toward reading versus audio books. Now, beware of the trap of, as a parent, we think, oh, if they're listening to an audio book, then they're not reading, right? They're still getting the vocabulary. They're still getting, you know, the storyline, the plot, the irony, things like that. Um, and so listening to an audio book is going to help strengthen their reading. Again, we do want to keep it in balance where maybe they, you know, they do some reading and they do some listening to audio books. We don't want to swing the pendulum too far in either direction. But, you know, if, if, a, if your kid wants to listen to stories and things like that, Fantastic. If they prefer to read, that's a good one also. I would actually, um, I, I think that, you know, I think that basic math facts, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, those are sort of really clean, easy ways. So when, if you're working on your addition, your multiplication or whatever, um, you know, sort of seeing it both ways and, and, you know, you could ask them, hey, would you like me to, let's, let's, if you're going to do a, I don't know, 10 question quiz saying, you know, would you like me to say them out loud and you can tell me the answer? Or would you like me to just hand them, hand you the paper and you can, you know, write the answer down. In the program multiplication, what we do is we combine the two, right? So this, I'm saying seven times seven while the student is seeing seven times seven. Um, and so, you know, trying to combine both of those along with music and interactive videos and things like that. But I actually just think basic math facts are a really good way to um, to sort of assess that. Great question. What else? Well, Alex, um, someone is, let's see, how do we best prepare our kids for the fall? Uh, let's see. But it seems they've already forgotten much of last year's math. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Again, right? First of all, they may not necessarily have forgotten all of last year's math. It may just be that they, their brain has not been activated to kind of remember that sort of stuff. Like, not to oversimplify it, but have you ever watched a movie and you get about 20 minutes in and you go, wait a minute, I've seen this already. But, and you realize, how did it take me 20 minutes to realize that I've already seen this movie? The brain was just sort of seeing it as new information. And then, but it took about 20 minutes to click in, right? Here's the other thing that I think we, we have done our, our kids a disservice in. One of the things that's weird about the way that we grade students, right, is we say, okay, if you get 90% on a test, it's an A. If you get 60%, it's a D. If you get 50%, it's an F, right? So, but think about what 50% actually means. If you learn something and you remember 50% of what you learned, imagine Imagine this hour that we spend together. If you remember 50% of every single thing we talk about, that is amazing. That is a huge percentage of remembering. But we've done it, we've, we, we assign it an F, right? We assign it, a, imagine if you read a book and you remembered 50% of the entire, everything that happened in the entire book. You'd get an F, but yet you retained half of it. So I think, you know, sometimes it just takes, sparking a little bit. It, it just takes getting into the math a little bit. Going, being patient, 
go in slow. Hey, do you remember some of it? And the other thing you can do is, you know, do you, you know, if let's say you're working on, I don't know, long division, right? And this, your kid doesn't seem to remember long division. Just back it up just a little bit. Okay, what about division with just shorter numbers? Do you remember this? You do a few examples. No, no, I don't remember that. Okay, well, what, what's the step before that? Maybe learning to skip count. Oh yeah, I know how to skip count. Okay, that's where you start and then you go forward. You don't have to start back at ground zero. Start with where you think they should be. Maybe work backwards a little bit until you get to where they are and then you can start to accelerate the learning well past where you thought they should have been. Look, it's, it's, it's a pandemic, right? This is crazy. The kids are thinking about so many things. Kids are stressed out. As parents, we're stressed out. I think get rid of the traditional what you think we should have learned. That brain is going in so many directions right now. And, um, and we've just got to be patient and, and, and loving and kind for ourselves as, as well as our, as our students. But again, give them a chance to get into the math a little bit before we really determine if they forgot it or not. You want to go one more, Leah? One, yeah, because this okay. one is one that I, I have an opinion. I hope, I hope, I hope we're in agreement, Alex. Maybe a I'll let you A couple of people have asked me um, whether it's okay if, if their students use their fingers when they do their math. I think so. Yeah, I think it's okay. Here's the thing. They're probably, if, if um, I mean, first of all, this, this is the first calculator that was ever really invented, right? These, these are the first math tools, right? I, I, I'm going to make a confession right now. I have a master's degree. Uh, I'm a math teacher. I still count on my fingers. Now, sometimes I, I hide it, right? I hide it. But, you know, someone says, uh, you know, seven plus five, I'm like seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, right? And sometimes I have to check it, right? It's totally okay. Here's the thing. Counting on one's fingers is a strategy, right? And so eventually what's going to happen is you're going to retain, uh, you're going to retain some of the base. You know, someone asked me what six plus six is. I've got that memorized. I've done it a bunch of times, so I don't need to do it. But fingers are a strategy that you can always fall back on if you need them. And hopefully you're always going to have them right there in front of you. So yeah, I think it's absolutely fine. And, and I, I do it myself. Yay. All right. All right, shall we keep going? Not to worry, I've got more for you. And uh, here we go. Okay, so moving right along, moving right along, let's get back to it. All right, so all, I can't believe we're all ready to number eight. I know we skipped five, but don't worry, I'll get back to it. So number eight, right? As a parent, just play some games, right? Playing games, almost every single game, board game, things like that, that I can think of has some sort of math involved, right? Monopoly. Many of us have played Monopoly. I know Monopoly's a long commitment, takes several hours sometimes, but uh, you know, Monopoly, never, in, you know, it, it's, gonna, it's hard to find another game where you can learn about some real world skills, like for even just counting the money, playing the banker, property, you know, paying rent, things like that, right? If you're playing, if you've got several kids taking turns, right? Taking turns being the banker, taking turns being the property manager, things like that. Monopoly, great way and you know, an awesome way to bond as well. Chess and checkers, may, you, may, they, might, they may not seem like they're specifically math related because there are no numbers, but if you think about it, the angle, we're, you know, learning to play chess and checkers really help with your problem solving skills. They help with your anticipation skills. You're looking at distance and angles. You're looking at, you know, look, a, a heavy, a, an intense word problem in pre-algebra or algebra is going to require three or four steps. In order to get to that last, like you've got to, when you start a word problem in algebra class, you're get, you got to be looking three or four steps ahead, right? You got to know what outcome that you're looking for. And playing games like chess and checkers can really help you start to formulate those steps and take things step by step. It's also, especially during COVID, if you are fortunate enough to, you know, live with, uh, if you've got a grandparent in the house or, or, you know, somebody else, things like that, if you're, you know, feeling safe on, on that sort of stuff, it's just a great opportunity to bond with somebody that, you know, you can bond with your own kid, or like I said, if you've got a grandparent around or somebody that, you know, your kids can play with and, uh, you know, learn, learn some math in, in the uh, process. Card games, right? 
card games are an amazing way to help us organize information. That's really what math is. It is the, you know, people who excel in math excel at organizing information. We're dealing with numbers, right? Think about it. If you're playing blackjack, te, uh, queens, kings, and jacks, they all represent 10. That's exactly what, you know, that's exactly what happens in math, where we start to have symbols and numbers that represent, excuse me, symbols and, and letters that represent variables and numbers. And of course, if you don't want to play a math game, play Scrabble. Get it? It's actually a math game, right? Because we've got to count up the number of points. Just having some fun, playing some games. Here's the thing. So often, I'll want to. I'll ask to, with my own kids to play a game, and they'll sort of grumble and groan. And I'll I'll get the game out already. And then once we start playing, they're totally engaged. They're totally enthralled. What I recommend: get the game out, get everything set up. So all the kid has to do is come down, come down, you know, come in, sit down, and you automatically start playing. What I realize is, if your kid seems resistant to games playing board games, things like that. It's not that they're resistant to games. They just don't want to go get the game and set it up. If the game's already set up for them, then they dive right in and have a lot of fun playing. Number nine, please, 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 please don't teach alone, all right? Don't feel like you've got to do this all by yourself. Now, everybody on this call today is in one of three situations. Either your child's school is going, starting up soon and going back full-time in person, but I have a feeling that's a very low percentage of us. Maybe you're going back in kind of a, a hybrid situation, right? A hybrid situation. I should say four situations. Maybe a hybrid situation where a kid's going to be in school part of, the, part of the day or part of the week and then at home with you. Third situation is your kid is part of a school with a teacher, but they're going to be completely remote. And then many of us I know have decided to just go full homeschool where we as parents are gonna take on the responsibility of doing the homeschool teaching. Whatever your situation is, please don't feel like you've gotta go at it alone, right? You've got other parents that you can fall back on. There are online tutors that, you know, tutoring is, uh, is you know, very popular and through Zoom has become much more affordable. John Hattie, the great educational researcher, did a meta-analysis of all the technology components and wh which technology components are most effective. Number one is interactive video. These are technology meaning like there's you're, nobody else in the room with you. Number one is interactive video, and number two is what we call intelligent tutoring systems. So if you can get somebody to help your child over Zoom, things like that, there's a whole lot of different ways. Look. If you are having trouble teaching fractions with unlike denominators, just go to YouTube, pull up videos on teaching, just you know, do a search on YouTube for teaching fractions with unlike denominators. I'm telling you, there have been some amazing videos. You don't have to create that all yourself. Don't teach alone and don't be afraid to ask for help. Email me, I'll help you myself. And finally, number 10, Sounds like somebody might need to mute. Number 10, don't forget to have some fun, right? Math can be totally fun when we're not focused on the fact that it just is math, right? So I know you came. I know you came for the fireworks today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to have a little bit of fun before we start to close this out. If you have a little piece of paper and a pencil or something around, then uh, go ahead and grab it really quickly, something to write with. We're just gonna do a little bit of math uh, and I'm gonna show you some really, really cool things with a little bit of math magic, all right? So here's what I'm gonna do. Leah, do you have the ability to unmute, so uh, unmute somebody? I sure do. Okay, great. So here's a little trick and I'm gonna show you this trick, right? I'm gonna show you this trick and then you can try it on your own kid. I'll even see if I can, uh, I'll be able to see if I can put it into the uh, chat box. So here's what I'm gonna do. All of you out there, I am going to attempt to guess your birthday. Now, come on, there's no way, you, you and I have never met except through this screen, right? But I'm gonna attempt to guess your birthday. So here's what I'm going to do. Hopefully you can see this. I know there's a lot of numbers up there, but I'm going to attempt to guess your birthday. Here's what I want you to do. 
I've got my little magic chart here with five columns of numbers, columns going down, right? What you're gonna do is you're gonna look at each column of numbers. And if the day that you were born, okay? I don't care about month, I don't care about year, just the day. If the day that you were born appears in that column, I want you to write down the letter that is at the top of the column. Okay, and you're gonna do that for every single letter that the day that you were born appears under. So let me give you an example. I was born on the 15th. I'm gonna take the letter M and I'm gonna look down the column under the letter M. There is no 15, so I'm not gonna write down M. I'm gonna look at the A. I do see a 15 under the A, so I'll write down 15. I'm gonna look under the G. I do see a 15 under G. I'll write down the G. I also see it under I and C, so I'm gonna write down the I and C. Those are gonna be your letters, but I need a little bit more information than that. I wanna know what is your favorite food and what is your favorite activity, right? What's your favorite hobby to do? So we're gonna see if I can uh, get this going. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I can pull this off, right? So. If you click on the, uh, I'll, I'll give you a second to write that down. Go ahead, write down your letters and something to write with. And then if you click on participants, you should see a little icon next to your name that looks like a hand that you can raise. If you raise your hand, if you raise your hand, Leah's gonna pick a few people, uh, just one at a time, and you're gonna tell us, uh, you go ahead and unmute the person, I'll have a quick conversation, and I will attempt to guess their birthday. Does that make sense, Leah? Okay, looks like we've got some hands being raised already. Let's see what we got. Oh, you're uh, still muted, Leah. Jennifer Green, you're unmuted. Yes, uh, so I'm supposed to tell you the day, I'm uh, the letter of the day, right? Yeah, for every day that, all the letters that the day appears under. So make sure you look at all of the letters. And if yes. the day, if the day yes. that you, what's that? Yes, G. Okay, now tell me something. What city are you coming to from us, coming from to us today? Burbank, California. All right. Perfect. Okay, and what is your favorite food? Pizza. Pizza, and your favorite activity to do? Reading. I'm going to say you were born toward the beginning of the month. It's coming to me. Were you born on the 4th? I was. What? How did he do that? Thank you so much, Jennifer. The math magician strikes again. Okay, Leah, who else you got for us today? Okay, let's see. Rochelle. Rochelle, all right. Rochelle. Rochelle, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. There she is. Hi, Rochelle. What city are you from? Uh, Visalia. Ah, very nice. Very nice. I know it well. All right, Rochelle, what is your favorite activity to do? Rollerblade. Ooh, and what are your magic letters? My magic letters. Um, actually, I was driving and I didn't pick them out. Sorry. Oh, okay. No it's worries. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. I don't want you to crash. We'll, we'll see if we can come back to you. Sound good? Okay. Wow, they're so engaged, they're even doing it while they're driving. Very nice. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Give us someone okay, else. Hey, Amanda. Hey. Blanco? Yes, hi. All right, Amanda, how are you? Good. What, what city are you in? Riverside. Okay, what's your favorite food? Um, lasagna. Okay. And what are your magic letters? M G I. Okay, and your favorite activity? I play uh, playing the trumpet. Ooh, trumpet toward the end of the month then. Uh, it's coming to you. Oh, I've seen a double letter. Were you born on the 22nd? Yes. What? How did he do that? The math magician strikes again. Okay, let's go for the trifecta, Leah. One more to prove my powers. Go ahead. Okay, Fabiana. Uh, Faraba. Faraba? I'm sorry, Faraba? Yes. All right. How Hi. All right, what does, is it Fariba? Is that how you say your name? Yes, Fariba. Okay, very cool. What city are you in? Uh, I am in San Jose. All right, and what is your favorite food? Uh, fish. Fish, okay, and your magic letters? M-G-I. Okay, and what is your favorite activity? My favorite activity, baking. Okay, 
Well, it's really weird. I've never had two in a row, but you were born on the 22nd also, weren't you? Yes. <laughs> oh, how did he do that? Okay, I could keep you in suspense all day. I know, I know, but I'm just going to show you and then I'll see if I can put the magic chart into the um, chat box so that you can... Uh, so that you can try this out on your own kids. Now, here's the thing. I don't want you to actually think it's magic. So here's what I did, okay? All you have to do if you try this on your own kids, and obviously you know their birthday, but you can do it, have them pick a, a different number or something like that, get, get creative with it, right? Is all you have to do is look at the number that is right below the letter and whatever letters you said, you add them up. So Fariba said, the six, six, uh, M, G, and I. So I looked at 16, added four to get 20, and added two to get 22, right? The first person said uh, just G, so that was an easy one, just four. So for example, if I said that my magic letters were A and G, you would add up the eight and the four to get 12. Feel free to try it on yourself one more time and see if it works. Look, math can be so much fun when we just stop and may, and allow ourselves to have some fun. All right, last, last one of the night before we open it up for questions. Little piece of paper. If you wanna grab your cell phone and use the calculator for this one, last one, one more trick that I like to call taco math. The math is a little bit more intense. Are you ready? Here we go. I want you to decide the number of tacos you could eat in one meal. Now be realistic, it has to be more than one, but less than 10. So your options are two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. How many tacos, they're just regular medium-sized tacos, how many tacos could you eat in one meal? Write it down or put it into your calculator right now, okay? Now, I want you to take your answer and multiply it by two to get a new answer. Multiply your answer by two to get a new answer. All right, you got your new answer. Take your new answer and I want you to add five. So take your new answer and add five. All right, you've added five, you got a new answer. Take your new answer and multiply it by 50. Multiply it times 50. Again, if you need to grab your calculator, go for it. About halfway through. Get your new answer. All right, here's where it gets a little tricky, so make sure you pay very close attention. You've got your new answer, right? Now, if you have already had your birthday, in the year 2020. So January 1st, all the way through today. If today's your birthday, happy birthday. So if you have already had your birthday in 2020, take your answer and add 1,770, 1,770. If you have not already had your birthday in 2020, so tomorrow through December 31st, I want you to add 1,769, 1,769. I'll give you a moment. Please remember my math magical powers only work on you if you do your math correctly. All right, you ready? Now, you've got your new total. One more crazy step. Take your new total and I want you to subtract the four digit year you were born. So I was born in 1973, I would subtract 1,973. Whatever year you were born, subtract your four digit year, that, subtract the four digit year that you were born. All right, I see a lot of people working hard out there. Almost there. All right, now 
Take your final answer, please, and circle it. Take your final answer and circle it. I am going to make a bold prediction. And if my prediction is true, I want you to click the thumbs up icon or the hand raise icon or the clap icon, whatever is available. Let's see, which ones are available? Let's see. Uh, yeah, well, click, click the icon there when you, all right, ready? I'm gonna make a prediction. I predict that you have circled a three digit number. The first number listed is the number of tacos you said you could eat in one meal. The second two numbers listed are your age. Did it work? Come on, give me a thumbs up or a hand raise if it worked. The math magician strikes again. Very, very nice. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you what, I already know what you're going to ask. And a lot of people are going to want to take a picture of that. So here we go. If you want to try it on your own kids, grab your cell phone, grab your cell phone. Or if you're using your cell phone, take a screenshot, right? Here are the steps. Go ahead. Feel free. Take a, uh, take a, a screenshot or a, um, a cell phone picture of the steps right there. Give you a second while you do that. Got it. And try this out on your own child at dinner. And let me go ahead and show the next one. And then if you want, there's the answer right there. Now think about, think about the math that we were just doing, right? We weren't focused on how hard it is. We weren't focused on what our test scores are. We weren't focused on, you know, what grade we were gonna get. We were just doing math because it was fun, because it was amazing, and because it is so very critical and important in our lives. And so, if I can give you a bonus, I guess back to number five that I missed, but if, of course, before I start to wrap this up and take some last questions, of course, if I can give you a bonus tip, you know I had to go there. Please, 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 whatever you do, make sure, do whatever it takes to make sure that your child masters their times tables. As you heard, I'm on a mission to help every kid master their times tables. I will not stop until it does. It is the one skill that will help them through algebra. And as we know, when kids pass, when kids take algebra, if they pass, they're much more likely to go on to a four year or, or go on to college. If they fail, they're much more likely to drop out of school together. Of course, please, if you can, feel free to check out multiplicationnation.com. It's totally free for an entire month. I want to help as many people as I can. Of course, if you're looking for something fun, if you are feeling like you're on your own, don't teach alone. We're here for you. I do believe uh, in a month, in the next few weeks or in a month or so, we're going to start back up with Wacky Math Hour. So sign up. You just uh, sign up at wackymathhour.com. We'll send you out the links. And uh, it's a free weekly math class. And we have so much fun. You don't have to teach alone. And if I can help in any way, please email me. I've already emailed, uh, been emailing with so many of you, it's alexkajitani at gmail.com, or you can just get a hold of me through my website at alexkajitani.com. Okay, so closing question, closing question before I answer questions, but uh, in the chat box, in the chat box, what is one idea that you have learned or confirmed in this session that you can use? What's one idea that you've learned or confirmed in this session that you can use? Go ahead, put them on, and then we're going to stop so that we can uh, ask questions. One idea that you've learned or confirmed in this session that you can use. I'll just go ahead and read from them. So math can be fun, teach where they are. Wait, yeah, that's a good one, Amelia, wait. Jennifer, resolving to play games with my daughter at least this coming week in preparation for her to go back to school. Petra, consistency is key. Alejandra, that competence comes before confidence, absolutely. Becky, everyday math happens everywhere. Yeah, I love it. Elizabeth, waiting 10 seconds. Yeah, it'll be the longest 10 seconds of your life. I promise you that. It'll feel like, 10. wow, 10 seconds never felt so long, but that's what it takes sometimes 
for kids to just process, for all of us to process. Talia says math is everywhere. And Tracy, instead of focusing on learning loss, focus on where they are, get them to where they can be, and maybe a little bit further. And Zamia, I don't have to teach alone. Okay, stop putting your comments in. Stop putting your comments in because I want to make sure that uh, Leah can see any questions that come in. We've got a few minutes left. So what questions do you have, Leah? What's What's her sure. what are some other questions? And let's, uh, I'm going to stop share so we can, uh, so we can okay. see. Okay, I think this is one that you can, a lot of parents can identify with. Um, how to handle a kid who's very frustrated and then just gives up when he gets his answer wrong because of simple calculation or careless mistakes. Yes. So first, what we want to do is we want to separate the ability to do math with getting the answer wrong, okay? A lot of kids get, I've seen a lot of wrong answers over my career, and it was not because the student did not know how to do the math, it was because they rushed through it, they did messy work, they did the whole problem perfectly, but then they blew three plus four and said it was nine, so it threw everything else off, right? So what we wanna teach is what we call error analysis. That is the ability to go back and see where it is that you messed up. When a student can go back and see where it is they messed up the problem, then they realize, oh, I did know how to do this. I just messed up three plus four. So again, sell them on the fact that just because you got it wrong doesn't mean you don't know how to do it. Look, that's where video games, right, have, video games have outdone us when it comes to teaching. On average, a typical teacher in a typical hour gives their students one bit of feedback per hour. Each student gets one bit of personal feedback per hour as to how they're doing. Video games give one bit of feedback as to how, how kids are doing every couple of seconds. Now, if a kid doesn't do well on a video game, they hit reset, they just start over, no biggie. They understand that getting it wrong or blowing up or whatever is part of the process. So talking to your kids and selling them on, look, it, you, you just, you, it's not that you don't know how to do it, it's just that you haven't done it enough or you don't know how to do it yet. And it doesn't mean you just messed up on this one little step. And so separating that. That being said, sometimes we have a kid who, you know, sometimes might just blow up. Sometimes they might just, you know, be in tears. I just can't do this. I'm done. Okay. Allow them to be done for now, but don't allow them to be done forever. Just say to them, you know what? Why don't we take a little break? We'll come back to this tomorrow morning. Sometimes it's not that the kid is frustrated with math. It's that they're starving. And it's hard to do math when you're starving. And so saying, you know what? Why don't we just go eat a little something, feel a little better? You know, before I was a math teacher, I was a restaurant manager. People would come into the restaurant hungry, like super mean to me. And on their way out, they'd be like, oh man, I'm so sorry. I was just so hungry. You know, we all, we all get hangry. Stop, get them something to eat and then come back to it. Don't let them be done forever. Just make sure you come back to it at some point. Our Alex, we're getting close to our one hour timeline. So, um, how fast the time goes. It goes so fast. You know, Alex is known as a rap mathematician, but I'm going to give him a little run for his money. Okay. Thank you, Alex, for that great presentation, helping us face math without hesitation. You made math feel easy and fun, finding math in everything we do under the sun. Thanks to our Zoomers who made it on the call. I hope this class helps your students this fall. Sadly, this is the last of your three great classes. So, so thanks again, Alex, from the Parenting Masses. Whoa, <laughs> give it up for Leah, very nice. Okay, I okay, so. To, oh, sorry, real quick, I, I forgot to say, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna email, I'm gonna email the uh, birthday chart and all the birthday magic tricks. I'm gonna email them to Cole and Cole will get them out to everybody because I just realized I can't actually, uh, I don't think I can put them in the, uh, well, I might be able to if you hang out at the end. Yeah, I think I can. I'll, I'll, I'll put the birthday magic chart and stuff uh, in the chat at the end if you feel like sticking around for an extra minute or two. But I'll also send them to Cole and he'll email them out. All right. I want to uh, take this time to thank you all for being on our call. And I want to ensure you have the opportunity to 
join your local PTA or join Golden State PTA. One of the questions in the chat was asking if you're homeschooling, can you join PTA? Yes, in fact, if you were to run your phone camera right over the QR code on this last slide, it'll take you right to our, our PTA website where you can join. I want you guys to remember that your membership matters more now than ever. PTA brought you this wonderful class with Alex's expertise and each of you on this call is an important part of our community. So I encourage you to join PTA in the fall. It's gonna look different, but we're still the community members that care about our kids and education. And we thank you very much for being on this call today. And thank you again to Alex.